Well, as you've been hearing, we've been getting unconfirmed reports that the baby of Shamima Begum, the teenager who fled the UK to join the Islamic State group, has died. We've been unable to independently verify the reports, but the family lawyer says he has strong but unconfirmed reports that the uh, boy who was two weeks old has died. Let's talk to our home affairs correspondent, Daniel Samford, uh, who's here with me. And it wasn't that long ago this same lawyer was saying the baby was healthy. So what's happened? Well, the news came just in the last hour or so um, when Mohammed Akunji, Tasmin Akunji, put out uh, on Twitter that he'd had these uh, strong but unconfirmed reports uh, that the baby has died. Uh, my understanding is that's come to him uh, from a source within the camp where Shamima Begum and her baby were uh, being interned. Uh, we've separately now also managed to have uh, some conversations with people involved in the camp and there is a suggestion that this might have been a tent fire, uh, a fire in, in her tent that uh, somehow the boys become injured as a result of that and have subsequently died. But it's not completely confirmed yet so I think we should sort of treat it with a little bit of uh, care. Uh, but it does look as if that uh, is true, that the baby has died and it might have been in a, in a tent fire. A tent fire raises questions uh, of how, whether, whether it was an accident or whatever, we, but we won't speculate on that. But uh, looking at the tweet, he was a British citizen. What does that, I mean, what are the implications of that? Well, well the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, accepted uh, in his many uh, statements in the House of Commons, questions that he answered in the House of Commons and before the Home Affairs Select Committee, that a child born, born to a British citizen in whatever circumstances uh, would be regarded as a British citizen by the British state. So that's a reminder from the lawyer as what, of what he believes that the gov British government's position was. And so I think it, it is fairly widely accepted uh, that her son was a British citizen. And of course, the family, Shamima Begum's family here in the UK, had asked for the government's help, not only in trying to get her to the UK, but also separately in trying to get their new grandson, nephew, to the UK, who, who was only a, a couple of weeks old. They wrote a letter directly to Sajid Javid asking for assistance uh, in bringing the baby out. Uh, they received a letter back from a Home Office official, not from the Home Secretary himself, uh, this week, saying, regarding Mr Begum's son, you've requested the contact is made with your solicitor to discuss the possibility of bringing your nephew to the UK. The request for assistance is not a matter for the Home Office, but for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. However, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office will require confirmation that Mr Okunji has instructions from Ms Begum to act on her behalf. And so it goes on, discussing the long bureaucratic process that might have to be gone through in order to get assistance for the baby. And then he goes on to say, I should add, however, that since 2012, the Foreign Office has had no consular representation in Syria, and our published travel advice has advised against travel to Syria since 2001. Um, which was essentially a, quite a long two-paragraph way of saying we're not going to help with the baby. And we've now seen uh, what has resulted from quick action um, not being taken. OK, well, I know if there's any more, you'll bring it to us uh, for now. Daniel, thank you very much. Daniel Sanford. Now, in the last couple of hours, we've had reports that the baby of Shamima Begum, the teenager who fled the UK to join the Islamic State group, has died. Now, we've been unable to independently verify those reports, but the family's lawyer says he has strong but unconfirmed reports that her two-week-old son has died. However, that's been countered by other BBC sources on the ground. The family's lawyer, Mohammed Tasmin Okunji, who's represented Shamima Begum's family here in the UK for four years, went on to Twitter, said that he'd had these strong, unconfirmed reports that, uh, that Shamima Begum's newborn baby had died. Uh, we've uh, spoken to some people involved in looking after women and children in the camp, and one of those people said that they'd also heard the same thing. Uh, but then the SDF spokesman, the, spoke, the official spokesman for the forces that are fighting uh, the Islamic State group in the area, uh, was, went on to Twitter also and categorically said that that was a fake report and that the baby was healthy and well. And these two uh, reports completely contradict each other. I've since seen the lawyer for the family uh, approaching the SDF spokesman on social media saying, listen, can you please get in touch? I'd like to try and get some confirmation of the truth. So um, I, I think it'll take a while for clarity to emerge, but uh, either someone's falsely told the family lawyer uh, that the baby has died um, or the baby has indeed died and I think it'll take us a while just to get to the bottom of that. 
And just remind us a little bit of the background to this. Her family had actually been trying to get her accepted back into the UK along with the baby. Yeah, there were two separate things going on. First of all, the family were trying to uh, get her return. She'd gone to join the Islamic State group as a schoolgirl, and they've always said that she was a victim rather than somebody who was really a supporter uh, of Islamic State. She clearly had suggested in interviews that she was reasonably supportive, but she'd re have ultimately regretted her decision to go. So the family were trying to bring her back to the UK, but separately they were requesting for assistance from the UK government to try and bring the newborn baby back. It was a sort of, if you can't bring her back, can we at least try and get the baby home? And so there's been a lot of concern about the conditions that the baby's living in, uh, and you know, we'll see what the truth of this story is, but clearly it may be that uh, that's all come too late. Daniel Sanford. Good evening. In the past half hour, it's been confirmed that the baby of Shamima Begum, the teenager who fled London to join the Islamic State group, has died. The family lawyer tweeted the news earlier in the day, which has since been confirmed by the Syrian Democratic Forces. Well, our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford joins me now. Um, and Daniel, just fill us in on what, on what we know as to what's happened to this little boy. Well, just as you say in the last half hour, the official spokesman for the Syrian Democratic Forces, Mustafa Bali, has confirmed that Shamima Begum's little baby boy, Jara, has died. He wasn't yet uh, three weeks old. Um, we've spoken to uh, paramedics who work at the Roj camp in Syria, which is the internment camp where Shamima Begum has been living for the last couple of weeks. And uh, they said that the baby has ran into breathing difficulties yesterday morning and uh, was seen first of all by the clinic there in the camp and then taken to a local hospital uh, where the baby was on a respirator for a while but they were unable to uh, stop the baby from dying and the baby died about lunchtime yesterday and that Shamima Begum was then uh, taken back to Rodge camp with her dead baby son and that the boy was buried at the Rodge internment camp. Um, the family were unsure about the reports that they had at first uh, as you say, the family's lawyer put out what he said was unconfirmed reports, and since then they've been trying to get the confirmation, and it really is only in the last few minutes uh, that the really final confirmation has come through that Jara's died. Clearly these were very difficult circumstances for her to be living in and for a tiny baby, and the medical facilities there would not have been comparable, for example, to those uh, in places uh, in the developed world. And listen, Shamima Begum left Britain as a schoolgirl to join Islamic State, and as Islamic State situation deteriorated, she ended up sleeping outside in Bahus through the Syrian winter. Uh, her other two children both died before Christmas. They were both also toddlers, um, uh, and then her um, newborn baby was actually born in Al Hul, uh, the first internment camp that she was at. Uh, she obviously was pleading then to be allowed to come back to, to Britain and bring her baby back. Um, but she had a bad cough. We could hear that in the interviews that we did with her. Uh, and it looks as if the conditions just were no good at all for a, a baby who wasn't yet three weeks old. And what do you think are the likely repercussions of the death of this little baby? Clearly, uh, the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, had stripped Shamima Begum of her British citizenship. But her baby was a British citizen. Yeah, the, the family, Shamima Begum's family, who, don't forget, four years ago, everyone had a lot of sympathy uh, for them because they'd lost a, a schoolgirl who'd run off to Islamic State, and at that point, Shamima Begum was being treated as a, a victim who'd been groomed. The family asked the, the British government to do two things. First of all, they said, could you try and bring Shamima Begum uh, home? And at which point the government said, well, actually, we've taken away her citizenship. Um, they then said, well, listen, there's a, a small baby here who was born to a British mother at the time, who's a British citizen. Sajid Javid seemed to accept in the House of Commons and at the Home Affairs Select Committee that uh, a baby born to a British mother in those circumstances was British. Um, so the family was saying, please bring the baby back at least and let us look after the newborn baby. They got a letter back from the Home Office about that this week. From a home, they'd written to the Home Secretary, but they got a letter back from a Home Office official saying, listen, it's not for the Home Office to, to do, deal with that, it's for the Foreign Office in any way. How do we know that uh, your lawyer is acting on behalf of Shamima Begum? And anyway, there's no consular assistance available in Syria, and anyway, we'd warn people not to go to Syria. So it was a sort of bureaucratic response that the family got. Uh, and of course, it's all academic now. I mean, the baby's dead. Uh, any response yet from the government, from the Home Office or the Foreign Office? Well, 
Before the news was completely confirmed, it was put to Sajid Javid in a BBC radio interview, uh, you know, what's your response? And he just, he said it, the news wasn't confirmed, but then uh, reiterated what uh, they've said in the past, which is, well, we've advised people not to travel uh, to Syria. I think the problem for the government is lots and lots of journalists have been able to go out and see Shamima Begum and her baby before the baby died. Um, British forces are fighting alongside uh, Kurdish forces in northern Syria, it would have been possible for someone to go and get the baby. It might have been politically difficult, but it would have been possible, and now, of course, it's not. Okay, Daniel Sanford, many thanks for joining us. Daniel Sanford speaking to me a little earlier. Well, we can speak now to the Conservative MP Bob Seeley, who is on the Commons Foreign Affairs Committee and served in Iraq and Afghanistan before entering politics. Thanks very much indeed for joining us this evening. Uh, what's your reaction to this news? I think it is incredibly sad, and Shamima Begum has my sympathy. This is the third child. Uh, that she's lost in the last few years and I think this young lady has made some incredibly bad life choices and is sadly suffering from her uh, from them as her children have done. But she clearly wanted to come to the UK yeah. partly because of concerns about her baby. She'd already lost two babies. The British yeah. government by stripping her of British citizenship effectively closed off that route. They did, although there was medical treatment um, at, at, the, um, uh, at the refugee centre and we can't undo, whether we like it or not, we can't undo what sadly just happened. Um, I respect the Home Secretary's decision. I think there is an argument for her to have come home, um, but sadly, as you say, that's academic now. Uh, despite this decision, this little baby boy was a British citizen. Should the British government have done more to get him to the UK to get him to a safer environment? Well, the Home Secretary made a decision. Um, I understand why he, do, uh, he did it. Personally, I think there's an argument that Shamima Begin should have been allowed to come back and, if need be, should have been prosecuted in this country if she could have done so. I do think there is a broader aspect here rather than just her case, which I think the media has slightly over-focused on, and that is that we've had 400 fighters that have come back from Syria uh, and Afghanistan, ISIS fighters, who have all been able to return, and only about 10% of those people are being prosecuted. So I think the wider picture here is that there is still a considerable security threat in this country, regardless of the very sad case of Shumi Begum and her three dead children. Just before we move on to the wider questions, though, do you think that the Home Secretary was right to take this action given the consequences that we have seen. We knew that she was concerned about the well-being of her baby in this camp. You say there were medical services there, but clearly they were insufficient to save the child. Well, we don't know how long it would have taken to, to get Shmi and Begum back even if she'd wanted to. Uh, it would have been very difficult to move her straight after the, the birth of her child. Um, and it might be that the child wouldn't have survived the journey. So we don't know what a, an alternative reality would have looked like. I respect the, uh, the Home Secretary's decision, and I think what he's done is he's put down a, a marker that British citizens, whether they've gone to, um, uh, to live in the caliphate as either fighters or ISIS brides and supporters, are not welcome back into this country. Now, it may be that the lawyers successfully challenged that in Shamima Begum's case, but I respect what he was trying to do. In this case, you could argue he may be right, he may have been wrong, but overall, what he has tried to do is set down as aggressively as possible a sense of profound anger that people have in this country to those people who went and served and supported ISIS, which was a vile and repugnant regime. You talked about the wider issues. Isn't there a problem if the UK and then perhaps other Western governments say that they simply don't want this, these people in their country, that you will then end up with potentially hundreds of citizens from the UK and from other European countries who have gone out, who have been involved with ISIS, who are going to be left uh, stateless, uh, hanging around these refugee camps and potentially causing a risk in the future? Potentially, but actually there's a bigger problem, I think, Carol, and that is the hundreds of people who've actually come back to this country already. We have over 400 fighters and supporters returning, less than 10% prosecuted. My worry is um, 
not those people that we know about, but actually those people who've returned and we didn't even know had gone in the first place, or people who have had access to British passports. Many of those people are traumatized. Many of them, if they fought in that war, it was a vicious and vile war where many um, acts of, of human rights abuses were committed. And those people may well be suffering from post-traumatic uh, um, stress, may have been really warped by their experiences. And even if they're not a danger now, they may be in the years to come, because PTSD takes years sometimes to kick into its fullest effect. And so what I'm most concerned about, yes, there are hundreds of people who may be wandering uh, the earth, uh, but actually I'm concerned about those hundreds of people that are back in the UK and that are living in our towns and cities and may not even be being monitored, uh, may not even be being monitored. Okay. Bob Seeley, many thanks for joining us via webcam from the Isle of Wight. Hello, very good afternoon to you. Welcome to BBC News. The baby son of Shamima Begum, the British teenager who joined the group that calls itself Islamic State, has died in Syria. The boy, who was less than three weeks old, is thought to have contracted a lung infection. His mother travelled to Syria as a 15-year-old four years ago. The Home Office had recently taken the decision to strip her of her British citizenship. Our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford reports. When the BBC first interviewed Shamima Begum two and a half weeks ago, she'd just given birth to a baby boy, Gerard. In his short life, he lived in one internment camp and then another. His mother said her two other children had already died at the end of last year. Losing my children the way I lost them, I don't want to lose this baby as well. And this is really not a place to raise children, this camp. Now medical staff in the Rog camp where she's living and the local military forces, the SDF, have confirmed to the BBC that her baby died on Thursday in a nearby hospital after having breathing difficulties. He's already been buried. The family are devastated. Uh, the family are not surprised. Uh, the there were concerns about the child's welfare. Uh, Shamina has lost her food card. She's made that quite clear and wasn't able to feed herself, let alone the baby. Shamima Begum's family had asked the Home Office for help, but the Home Secretary Sajid Javid's response was to take away her British citizenship, and the government gave them no assistance in trying to bring her two-week-old baby boy to the safety of the UK. In a letter sent by the Home Office this week to Shamima Begum's sister Renu, an official wrote, The request for assistance in this matter is not for the Home Office, but for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But then the official wrote that, since 2012, the Foreign Office has had no consular representation in Syria. It was a point Sajid Javid reinforced yesterday after reports of the baby boy's death first surfaced. The Foreign Office has been clear for many years. There is no British consular presence. There's no way that anyone can be helped in any way, including innocent children. This is why it's so dangerous. Labour has described the Home Secretary's decision-making as callous and inhumane. Save the Children said more than 60 children under the age of five had now died in the camps and called on the UK and other countries to take responsibility for their citizens in northeast Syria and take them home. Daniel Sandford, BBC News. Well, the BBC's Middle East correspondent Quentin Somerville is in northern Syria. He first met with Shamima Begum not long after she'd given birth to her son, who was named Gerard. Quentin told us a little earlier about the conditions that Shamima is now living in. The circumstances that people are being held, whether they're victims of IS or uh, supporters of IS here in northern Syria, are pretty grim. Uh, when I met Jarrah, uh, who was just a few days old, he was in good health um, and I asked Shamima Begum how, how her baby was doing. She said he was doing well at that time. But it's very cold here. Uh, the camps don't have enough blankets. They don't have enough tents. Uh, there isn't enough food in some cases. Uh, and, and the people there are struggling and they're angry. And it's a dangerous situation too. It's still a stressful situation. So Jarrah was, uh, was in good health then, but he deteriorated. And yesterday we heard that him and his mother had been taken under armed escort to, uh, to a hospital and he died shortly after lunchtime. The cause of death was listed as pneumonia. It's worth remembering that in the long, miserable story of the Islamic State, the suffering isn't yet over. 
people who were trapped inside or who stayed inside with the Islamic State till the very end were starving. Many, many of those who've left suffered from malnutrition. More than 100 people have died leaving that last IS stronghold. Uh, and now in the camps, just in the last few days in the camps, we've seen 16,000 people arrive. It's a huge number, far many more IS supporters than everybody realised. Uh, the bombardment was very difficult for them, but that, that intense fighting and the circumstances were awful. And as a result, uh, an increasing number of people have fallen ill and in some cases, as with Girard, have died. Well, Kirsty McNeil is from the charity Save the Children. She came into our Westminster studio a short time ago and told me the decision to stop Shamima Begum returning to the UK had been wrong. It's utterly tragic. So this is a little baby boy, not yet three weeks old, who's died of pneumonia, a British child who could have been here in safety and unfortunately he's been terribly let down by Britain. You say he could have been here in safety, that the Home Secretary was interviewed yesterday and said uh, that there hasn't been consular access in Syria f since the war began, pretty much, that it's not a safe place in which, uh, for example, British officials could go and be involved in any attempt to bring the baby out, and, and that therefore there wasn't really anything the government could have done. Well, British journalists have been able to get into the camp, and of course it's serviced by aid workers. It's not up to a humanitarian organisation like Save the Children to comment on what kind of private diplomacy mm. might have been able to get the child and their mother out. But it's clear that the decision to strip the mother of citizenship was taken not thinking about the best interests of a child. This is the third child that's been lost to this particular mother, and it's against a backdrop where 84 people have died on their way to or when they've just arrived at this camp two-thirds of which are little children under five years old. Um, just on that question of the, the scale of the, the pressure that is now on that a, a refugee camp because of the large numbers of people who are coming into it, some of them, of course, will have been fighters with the group that calls itself Islamic State. Others will have been uh, girls and women who, who were married or living with uh, those men. What sort of pressure is that putting on? What is the ability to supply food, shelter, warmth for that large number of people? Our understanding is that over 90% of the people in this camp are women and children. There's right. about 54,000 people there in freezing temperatures. So a lot of the people that have died have died of hypothermia or because they haven't had enough food. This particular little boy, as I say, not even three weeks old, died of pneumonia. And so your viewers understand how a child would die of pneumonia. Essentially, they die of exhaustion because their little body simply gives up fighting because it's so hard to breathe. These are no places for children, but certainly no places for newborns. I'm sure, actually, uh, I'm sure everyone would, would agree with what you're saying there. I suppose the practical difficulty in the case of Shamima Begum's case was that this is a woman who had voluntarily left this country to live in another country, to be involved in a conflict situation. Is that really something where it can be the obligation, you think, on politicians and officials in this country to do something about? Well, the best interests of her children, of course, have to take priority, regardless of how we feel about the decisions of the parent. The best interests of the children come first. But it is worth remembering, in this specific case, she was 15 when she left, a child herself. So someone who's been radicalised in Britain remains Britain's responsibility. And we all have questions to answer about how that could have happened in our country and what obligations we owe, not just to her, but crucially, as I say, to her little ones now. You say 90% of, of those who come into the camp are women. Presumably, at least some of them those women will be British or will have been British citizens originally and many of them presumably will have had children since they were out there since that's sort of part of the package as it were of, of going to to live with uh, the group that calls itself Islamic State. Um, what then happens to those children? They, clearly they haven't had the spotlight or the attention that Shamima Begum's case has had. Do they have legal status as British citizens if their mothers were British? So we found about two and a half thousand children in the camp that are the children of foreign nationals. Right. Not, of course, all of British, course, from all yeah. sorts of different countries. But two and a half thousand uh, children who are born to mothers who were not originally Syrian but came exactly. to Syria. Yeah. Yeah, so around two and a half thousand children who are born to mothers who are owed an obligation by their own states. We can't keep passing this problem around. If you're a citizen of a country, you remain that country's responsibility. But not just two and a half thousand children of foreign nationals. We found 50 children who are completely unaccompanied without anyone to look after them. They, of course, are not in the spotlight, but they are our number one concern to save the children. 
Hello, welcome to BBC World News. Britain's governing Conservative Party has defended the decision to revoke the citizenship of a London teenager, Shamima Begum, who joined the Islamic State group in Syria. It said that the step was taken last month in the national interest. The government has faced renewed criticism since it emerged on Friday that Ms Begum's new newborn baby had died in a camp in northern Syria. The opposition Labour Party said stripping her of citizenship was callous and inhumane. Shamima Begum and two school friends travelled to Syria to join IS four years ago. Chichi Zundu reports. Baby Jera, born in a camp, used to hold ISIS fighters, their wives and children. Pictured with his mum, 19-year-old Shamima Begum, less than three weeks old, now dead from pneumonia and buried at the same camp. More than 65,000 mostly women and children call this home. Both a refuge and detention center, those who chose to join ISIS and are now fleeing the fighting have ended up here. Conditions at the camp mean little food and little warmth. Last month, the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, confirmed the boy was a British citizen and said he had considered the child's interest when deciding to revoke Miss Begum's citizenship. Criticism now at the UK government's door that the life of that child could have been saved. Fasim Barabandi is a former Syrian diplomat and co-founder of People Demand Change. It's involved with conflict mediation and rebuilding civil society structures in Syria. Uh, they've also been working with international governments to provide humanitarian aid. Uh, thanks very much for being with us. Give us an idea of what conditions are like on the ground in these camps. Yeah, thank you for having me. The camps used to be before 10, 15 days from now. It's fully populated, fully, fully full of people. Uh, remember that the fight to defeat ISIS has been starting quite a long time now. And all the IDPs are moving to this camp, which is, have something like more than 40,000 Syrian IDPs um, in the last two weeks. And since the counter ISIS coalition, they are cleaning the last pocket of this terrorist organization, the number almost doubled. The, the issue is that there's, there's, they need everything. You, can, you cannot imagine the needs that over there. The UN, humanitarian assistant, they are trying their best to do it. Yet the challenges is big. The numbers of people are coming are large. To know who's who is very difficult to question. We don't want at the end of the day to let the terrorist group to infiltrate the refugee camps or the IDP camps. Yet, humanitarian perspective, the food, the medicine, it should be provided for everyone. The well, challenge you, I just, is, on, uh, just on that, sorry to yes, interrupt, sorry. but that's a really interesting point. How do you try and distinguish between people who need help and those people who might be there, terrorists coming through? How on earth, on the ground, do you actually sort people? We, there's no way. There's no, as a humanitarian aid, it's a humanitarian aid. That's... That's, that's the bottom line of it. Everybody should get the food, medicine, any, any need of assistance. This, this, is, this is not a question. That I'm saying about the challenges that we, not us as a as small organization, but the, as counter-ISIS coalition or the international community, the number of people who joined the IDB camps over there as a number is a huge, is large number. And that big challenge by itself. Uh, we don't know who's who. It's not our job. It's... There is the counter-ISIS coalition are there, the local forces, SDF are there. There's, this is their job to do. But you, I'm saying again about the challenge. Yes, sir. Yeah, you've, you've, talk, you've talked about the short-term uh, short problems. Uh, in the long term, um, of course, there will be people there who will have been brainwashed under the previous regime. This is a long-term problem. It's, it's disaster because here we are not talking about the brainwashed people. We have a kids that has been raised, born and raised under ISIS ideology. So for them, they don't have accept that ideology. So when they look about the humanitarian aid, about the other community, the international community, they don't see it except as an enemy. There's a big challenge to deal with these people. And this is long-term challenge for the whole international community. We are talking about thousands and thousands of kids that they need education, they need to reset their mind, they need to be address psychologically, educational terms, values. They need, you know, to generate, to challenge the whole generation. 
Yeah, and that would be huge, 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 huge challenges. It's a huge challenge. Huge, huge it's a huge challenge is over there. Okay, yeah, Bassam, so it's, it's, so, Bassam so Barbani, forgive me. Beyond, forgive me, we are so running problem, out of time, but thank yeah, you very yeah, much for joining us, Bassam Barbani. So the problem is much further than the humanitarian. Thank you.